Well, good morning. How's the greatest church on the planet doing today? You guys ready for the word today? Man, I am so excited. I want to say a big welcome home to all of our first and second timers with us today. And those that are that are in our Highlands family online, the online campus, can we put our hands together for them this morning? Welcome home, guys and gals. Glad you guys are with us. We are so grateful for you. I, I mentioned this last week, and for those that, that were not able to be with us last week, um, I want to brag on the generosity of our church because we're still getting stories of, of how the, uh, the, the student retreat, the winter student retreat impacted the next generation. I am, I'm, we had two other churches that joined us, and, uh, and, and I've spoken with, with some of their representatives, and they're like, man, this has been a really great time. And what we're praying for, and I'll just tell you, uh, Pastor Caleb and I, we spoke this past week, and I said, let's believe God. Let's believe God for hundreds of kids. So we're, we're believing God for even like multiplied effect. For next year, this time, next year, same place. So we couldn't do that with without you guys. I, I got the breakdown and said, okay, so what was the price per head? Okay, how much did it cost us? And guess what? The math never works out. <laughs> like it cost us, the church, more than it cost the, the, the families to go on. But because of the generosity of you, Highlands Church, no child that wanted to go was said no because of scholarships, because of, of, of people stepping in saying, listen, I want to take, I want to care, take care of that family or that child. Thank you so much for that. We, we appreciate that. We believe in the next generation. Generation. And we, we, we put our money where our mouth is here at Highlands Church. Isn't that right, everybody? Yeah. Uh, I'm so excited about, about God's word today. Um, I want to give a shout out to um, a, a person that we ran into the other night at Magianos. I'm trying to lead by example. Pastor Sondra and I had a date night the other night. And we went somewhere with metal hardware. Like, you know what I'm saying? Like metal utensils with a tablecloth. We didn't ask for the super size this time, you know, and, but we had such a good time and, and got a chance to share our faith uh, with, with a, a, the, the waitress that was helping us did an amazing job. And I told her, I said, if you watch, we're going to give you a shout out. We just encouraged her with, her with her relationships, gave her some great resources, some books to read. But Daisy, I told you, if you watch, I'd give you a shout out. So thank you. You did an awesome job. And I hope to see you next, uh, I was going to say next week. I hope to see you real soon. I mean, my, waistline, my waistline can't take next week, but I will, we will definitely see you really, really soon. God bless you. I pray that God moves on your life today, Daisy. I really do. And matter of fact, I will say this right now. If you're here today or you're watching online, God has something special he wants to download into your life. You may think you've just clicked on. You think you've maybe just rolled in and parked your car and walked into this auditorium. But God is going to down something, download something in your heart that will mark your life if you'll let it. Like, don't, don't let this moment pass you by. I cannot tell you the times that I have been minding my own business and coming to a worship experience and God have a word for me. And God wants to do that in your life, like in a, in a, in a powerful, powerful red letter day. And before I, before I even share the first thing, I, can I just pray? I believe that we're gonna open up our lives for what God has for us today. Heavenly Father, I pray that I would hide behind the shadow of your cross today, that your word would just come alive to us. It would jump off the pages of, of, our, of, our, of the Bible, of our smart device, whatever we're looking on, God, that your word would speak. It would speak truth. It would be wrapped in grace. It would, it would challenge us not to behave better, but to become who you've called us to be. God, I pray that for any broken marriage in this place, any broken life or any, any wounded physical body in this place, that healing would happen today. Healing would happen today. In Jesus' name, amen. Yeah. Amen. Well, we are in part two of a series we're calling Messy. And, and um, I had a, a, one of the guys' small groups that was meeting at a restaurant, I think Friday morning. They sent me some, some texts and they said, hey, here's some pictures that, that reminded us of the, of, the, uh, the, of the series that we're doing, Messy. The first one, Come on, somebody, that's, that's messed up. Relax and accept the crazy. I said, no, 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 we don't accept crazy here. No, remember last week we said we do messy because all of us, myself included, all of us are a little messy. We do messy, we don't do crazy. Can I get an amen at Highlands Church? So you do not accept the crazy. You do not buy that sign at Cracker Barrel, okay? But I do like this one, okay? This one's even better. Your crazy is showing you might want to tuck that back in. Hey, come on. Now, I give you permission to buy that one and hang that one on your front door. 
right? You know, isn't it funny? People, we all are, are messy. Relationships can be messy, and and um, and Jesus did not. It did not appall Jesus. He didn't. He didn't run away from messy. Matter of fact, he stepped into humanity because we. He knew that we needed a savior. We thought we needed a king. He said, "No, you need to be. You need a savior. It's what you need." And 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 I want to start right here. We're going to take a little different element to it, uh, angle to it today. Um, we know that that from Scripture that our life has been written by God. All right, now, now look at what the Bible says. In Psalm 139, your eyes saw my unformed body. All the days, like all of my days were ordained for me, were written in your book before one of them came to be. So here's a question that, I, that I'm asked from time to time. Um, are you telling me that God wrote all the junk that I'm experiencing? Like, so is it is God caused it or God allowed it? And, and is that God's plan for my life? And I would even say this. Well, let me explain it like this. God has this beautiful story that is written for your life. And sometimes the messy parts of us, we add chapters in our story that God never intended. Amen. Oh, come on. Can I get a better amen? Because we blame stuff on the devil and they're like, oh, I didn't write that, but okay, I mean, I, I'll take credit for that. No, maybe it was some decisions. Maybe it was some of the words that we said, some of the attitudes, some of the offense, some of the bitterness that we've walked in that's caused our life to unravel. And we wrote some chapters that God himself said, that's not my best for your life. All right? But, but here's something that's also a cool twist to this is I'm seeing... I guess the older I get, the more I, the, the more I walk this thing of, of life out, I see this. It's not about how you start, but how you finish. It's not about how you start, but how you finish. Anyone can start a blaze. Anybody can come out and come out of the chute red hot. Talk to me when you've walked with Jesus for decades, and then you have my attention. Walk with me when you walked in integrity, clean hands, pure heart, for decades, then you can talk to me. But anybody can start strong. I believe it's God's will for us to start, sustain, and finish strong. And the Bible says in Hebrews chapter 12, verse 2, God instructs us, this is how it's going to work. You need to fix your eyes on Jesus because he is the author and the finisher of our faith. So this is what I want to help you do today. I want to help you to get the pen out of your hand and into the author and the finisher of your faith's hands. Get the pen out of your hand because we've written some stuff that God never intended for your life. But guess what? God says, but if you'll give me the pen, I'll turn that thing around. It's kind of like that plot twist. I started this way and man, things fell off. The wheels fell off my life. But God redeems some things, which means to buy back and to put in his original intent God has this ability to redeem your life. And in other words, we have to get to this moment where we go, my life is not my own. I was bought with a price and I surrender. That's, that's, what, that's what, what quitting being the boss means. I surrender my life to Jesus. Now, this is what I want to do. Start part two with this. Part two is I want to talk about one of the messiest people in the Bible now, you, you know him as one of the writers. There's only one, check this out, there's only one author of the scriptures. It's the Holy Spirit. There are several writers, people that wrote, in, uh, wrote into the, the Bible, but there was only one author. His name is God. But two-thirds of the New Testament was written by the person I'm going to talk about today. His awful, messy life is Paul, the Apostle Paul. He, he, he was known as a church planter. Um, an apostle, someone who starts works, and then some of the writings that he wrote that he would go and check on the check on the churches that he started. Sometimes it was to encourage them, and sometimes it was to rebuke them and to give them a spanking, right? But but in Acts, this is the first place that we see the apostle Paul show up in the scriptures. All right, he was referred to as Saul, not Paul, yeah, but Saul. Acts chapter 7, verse 58, they, this religious mob, rushed at Stephen and dragged him. Stephen was this evangelist, right? He was sharing the good news. He was tell, very vocal in his faith. He was dragged him out of the city and began to stone him, okay? His accusers took off their coats and laid, laid them at the feet of a young man named who? Who? 
so, so we've got a mob that was stoning. I'm not talking about, I'm talking about with rocks, okay? So they were stoning, they were murdering this guy named Stephen and all the people that were participating were taking the, their cloaks and laying them at the feet and he was watching them. And other, some scholars say that he was overseeing it, he was permitting it, he was the one that was instigating it. In Saul, verse, eight, uh, verse one of, of chapter eight, the next chapter, Saul was one of the witnesses and he agreed completely with the killing of Stephen, the same guy that was vocalizing his faith in Jesus Christ, and a great wave of persecution began that day, sweeping over all of the church in Jerusalem. Now, you think your life was messy. You think you lost it because you cussed the cat the other day. But I'm telling you right now, that, that's a southern thing for all of my northern friends, if you think your life is a mess, God says that is exactly the kind of people that I love to use because when I use their life, everyone would say it had to be God. It, ha it has to be God. Now, here's a little background. Jesus lived his life. He paid for sins on the cross. The church is born in Christianity began to grow just rapidly. I've talked about that in weeks ago. You can watch that online. And this religious this, this, this movement was called a cult in the eyes of religion because it was not the religion of the day. There's this, this massive thousands of people that were following the man named Jesus. Now, he was the Messiah, the son of the living God. Now, the one guy that was radical about stopping that was Saul, Saul of Tarsus. His name was referred to later on as Paul. Now, it, this is not in the Bible. This is my holy imagination. Will you give me a little grace today? Okay, so this is not in the Bible, but, but I can imagine God the Father having a, a conversation with Jesus, the Son, and they're in heaven. Holy imagination, not in the Bible, you can't, can't find it. Second hesitations, that's where it's at, okay? So God's like, you know what, it, it, Jesus, look, you gave your life for all humanity, and the, the good news was spreading like wildfire, but you know what, I think you may have picked the wrong guys because it's come to a screeching halt. And Jesus is saying, no, 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 Heavenly Father, I, I, I picked the right crew, and things were going great, and they was multiplying by the thousands and tens of thousands until this guy named Saul of Tarsus came in. That's when the parking brake went up. That's when all the problems that we started to see is when, when he came on the scene, and God steps back and says, okay, so Saul, Saul is stopping all that you built, huh? He said, that's right. It's his fault. And God says, okay, Saul, he's a great writer. He's educated. He's a Roman citizen, so he'll be able to travel with ease. He likes to travel. He's very stubborn. Hmm, sounds like my guy. And he says, all right, this is what I want you to do, Jesus. I want you to go to earth and I want you to appear to him. I want you to have a come to Jesus meeting, as we say in the South, <laughs> with Saul, because he's on the road to Damascus to hurt more of our kids. You thought your life was messy. And the Bible says that Jesus does just that. He says, I want you to be on my team. Now check this out. Meanwhile, while Saul was still breathing, Acts chapter nine, verse one, uh, 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 breathing murderous threats against the Lord's disciples, he went to the high priest and asked him for letters of the synagogues in Damascus so that if he found any who belonged to the way, what is the way? Those are the followers of Christ. They belong to this new movement of people that were following Jesus as their Messiah. Whether men or women, he might take them as prisoners to Jerusalem. As he nears Damascus on his journey, suddenly a light from heaven flashed around him. He fell to the ground and he heard a voice say, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? Why, why, why are you persecuting me? Well, wait a minute, Jesus, I'm not persecuting you. I'm persecuting, persecuting your followers. Guess what? Jesus is the head and we are the body. When you touch the pinky toe, you touch the head. And he goes, why, why are you persecuting me? So all the, Jesus goes back, has this encounter, and, and all of a sudden there's this radical transformation that comes in, in, and you can read more of yourself this week. Radical transformation. He has a meeting with Jesus, the Messiah. And this is what Paul's look, life looked like after that meeting, after that encounter, after he, he, he met with the Son of God, Acts chapter 9, verse 20, at once he began to preach in the synagogues that Jesus is the Son of God. 
Wait a minute. He was persecuting them because they said he, they were following the way. Then he's the one that grabs the mic in church and says, let me tell you something. He is the real deal. Jesus is the son of the living God. Then all who heard him were astonished and asked, wait a minute. Isn't this the man who raised havoc in Jerusalem among those who called on his name? And hasn't he come here to take them as prisoners to the chief priests? They thought it was such a radical, trans it was a 180 turn that they thought, no, this is a trick. This is a setup to imprison more people because he's saying just the opposite. By the way, that's what repentance looks like. One way, change my mind, go in the opposite direct direction. Then it says, yet Saul grew more and more powerful and baffled the Jews living in Damascus by proving that Jesus is the Christ. So Saul went from murderer to preacher. And you thought your life was messy. You think, I've, gone, I've, I've done too much. I've said too much. I've gone too far. And God says, you're just the candidate that I'm looking for. So if your life is perfect, and if your life really does look like an Instagram post, and, and, and you, your kids behave in the car on the way to church, and when you pray at the restaurant after church, all of glory falls down. I'm glad you're here, but this message is not for you. This is for all the messy people at Highland Church today. Okay, can I get a thank you, Jesus? Yes, all the real people, please stand up. I'm not saying, I'm just saying. So what, what's the game changer? What do I need? I'll tell you what you need. You need an encounter with Christ. You don't need another good preaching sermon. You need to meet with Jesus. You, you need to meet with God himself. And Yes, but Pastor Al, do you expect us to go home today and be on Highway 400 and have a bright light hit me? I hope not. Okay, matter of fact, if you're in a car accident, don't walk toward the light. I'm telling you right now. But, but. That's, I'm going to give you some practical ways for your messy life to be turned into a message. And this, is, this was proven out in the Apostle Paul's life. And if I had more weeks just to speak on this one topic, I could take you from the Old Testament, from Genesis to Revelation, all the messy people that God took delight in using. And when he used them, people said, it had to be God. It had to be God. So the, this is what I want to do. Paul's messy life teaches us to deal with our failures like this. Write down. I'm a note takers. Write this down. Number one, say goodbye to yesterday. I get it. I get it. You weren't hugged enough as a kid. I get it. Your teacher was mean to you. I get it. The coach yelled at you. I get, I get it. But just say goodbye to that. Quit using that as an excuse. And I'm not saying suck it up buttercup. I'm not that guy. I'm, I, I want to know. I, I do empathize with you. And, 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 and words are real. And words do put a lid on people's destiny. But can I tell you, God can also lift that lid off of your life. This is a word for someone. You can't unscramble those eggs. I get it. But it's time to get up and grow up and walk forward with Jesus. We are living in a soft society. And I found myself, I think I heard a clap. Thank you. I think I'll just wait for that clap. It, can we just get a little gumption in us and quit being so soft and say, okay, I get it. That was wrong. That was wrong. But through Jesus, I am healed, healed, healed. Okay? I, I'm just, I'm, I'm over the soft culture of our country right now. It's, it, it's almost as if things aren't easy. It must not be God. Where in the Holy Scriptures is that even listed? Matter of fact, if, you're, if life is so easy right now, you might be walking with the devil instead of against him. Philippians chapter 3, verse 13. But one thing, this is the Apostle Paul. One thing I do. He said, I, don't, I, don't, I haven't figured it all out, but I know one thing I've got to continue to do is forget what is behind. What, what does he have to forget? I'll tell you what he has to forget. He has to forget the day that he held on the cloaks of the people that killed one of God's men. And he approved of it. He was totally fine with it, was cheering it on. He said, I've got to forget that. Then he says this, and strain toward what is ahead. I press on. Why? Because life would want me to stop. Life wants me to quit. Life wants me to play it safe. The American Christian culture wants me to play it safe. I can't do that. Why? Because people need Jesus and they're around me. And I'm sorry if I offend you or not, but the world has let you down. Let me give you someone who will never let you down. 
I'm about to preach in 930 service. I press on toward the goal to win the prize for which God has called me heavenward in Christ Jesus. He had to forget separating husbands and wives. He had to forget separating kids from their parents and persecuting them and having them murdered. He had to forget that. Let's let's just say this. You must settle yesterday's once and for all. And can I just get super practical? The best way for you that I've discovered for people to get past their past is this, by walking side alongside of a community of other Christ followers. It's only found, write it down, in small groups. It's only found in small groups. Pastor, it's at the altar. I'll pray for you. I absolutely will pray for you. And I'll pray that you would get your tail in a small group walking in the same spiritual direction of other people that are serious about honoring God with their life. I'm not mad today. (laughs) I'm not mad today. I've just seen it for decades now. And there's nothing new under the sun. Get in a small group. Put your life around people that are fired up for Jesus. You You don't put great players with sorry players. They don't get better. You get great players with other great players and they become championship winners. I want to get people around people, my kids around people that are, they they love, they love Jesus. I want my kids around in a small group. But can I just tell you, our kids are in small groups. My, 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 uh, My oldest doesn't even, she lives in Birmingham, Alabama. She's in a small group in her church. Right? Why? Why? Because that's what we do. We're Christians? No. Because I want to get better. I want to grow in Christ. Second thing, are you glad you came to church? Okay, number two, this Paul's messy life teaches us how to deal with our failures. Find the benefit in every bad situation. Just find the benefit in every it, When you fall down, when, not if. When, not if. When, not if. Ah, when, not if. I just, I probably won't miss it this week. Your pastor probably will. <laughs> When, not if, when you fall down, while you're down, clean up the floor. Just go ahead and clean up the floor while you're down there. Make the best of every bad situation. I'm just going to, I, I, you know, joy is a choice. While I'm down there, I might as well just choose joy. I could choose joy on my knees just as easy as I can stand up. The real reason we get up so fast, are you ready for this? Because we are so image conscious. We don't want anyone to know that we fell or we made a mistake or we lost our temper or we got a bad attitude and no one was in the room, but you know and God knows that your heart went wrong. We, you can't learn from that which embarrasses you. <laughs> can, I, can I tell you a funny story? This is a funny story. This is not a bait and switch. It's a funny story. Everyone's got that crazy uncle or crazy aunt in their family. I think I'm that one in my family, honestly. But I, I had, I've got them on both sides of my family. Uh, in my mom's family, her name was Aunt Ruby. That sounds like, an, that's, a, that's, a, that's a fun name, Aunt Ruby. Aunt Ruby was so much fun. I'm not going to tell you her, her my, my, my nickname for her because y'all get offended. But um, she was so, she could talk the ears off a doorknob. I mean, she just talked, 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 talk, and hilarious this laugh coming in a room. And she, she was in a department store back in the 80s. And she was, she was talking, and she's, she's, she met this person. She was standing next to them in, in line, just talk, and tall person. Had sunshades and a hat, long sleeve and a jacket. She just talked, talk, 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 Aunt Ruby, just talk. Talk, talk, talk. And right in the middle, maybe like three minutes out into the conversation, she says, you know something? You haven't said two words to me. You don't talk much, do you? She looked up, it was a mannequin. She said, oh, my gosh, honey, I've been talking to a man. She started talking to this person. I've been talking to a mannequin for five minutes. Can you believe that? I am so embarrassed because they haven't said two words. Looked up. It was another mannequin. (laughs) True story. Aunt Ruby. You know what we do today? We would leave the clothes on the hangers and run for the door because we're so image conscious. Can can I tell you something? Why Why don't you just clean up the floor while you're down there? Just like, learn to laugh at yourself. It, 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 Paul is in jail. God says, I want you to go change the world, take the gospel. And Paul's in jail. He's like, this is not changing the world. But while I'm down here, I might as well start cleaning the floor. 
I don't understand it, and I don't have to like it, but I will be used by God on my knees. I may have more questions than I got answers. I may get a little bit mad from time to time. It doesn't mean that I don't love Jesus. It means that I'm just working out my salvation. And I'm just going to clean the floor while I'm down here. He's like, well, you know what? I'm, I'm in jail. I might as well just write some letters to the churches I planted. He had no idea they'd end up in the Bible. He's chained to a Roman guard. He says, well... I've got a captive audience. <laughs> I might as well clean the floor while I'm down here. And some of you right now, you've left your cloth at the house because you're mad at God because you fell. Or you think you've fallen, and it could be a thing where maybe you did everything right and you still ended up here. Could it be the sovereignty of God has connected your life with someone else that needs you and needs what you have in you? who you have in you? Could it be even your bad decision that caused you to end up like this? God says, if you'll let me, I can redeem it. But if you're so embarrassed in how your image is and you're gonna leave your cloth up there, he says, I'm gonna let you stay down there for a while. I'm in no rush. You can make another lap around that mountain, Hal. Or if you fall, you can go, while I'm down here, I might as well to get something to happen. Am I helping anybody today? He said this. He, this is what the Apostle Paul said in first, 2 Corinthians chapter 4. He says, we are hard pressed on every side, but not crushed. He said, he said we're perplexed. I don't, but I'm not in despair. I, I'm, I'm persecuted, but I'm not abandoned. Yes. <laughs> I, I'm struck down but I'm not destroyed. Uh, but for our light and momentary troubles, can I just stop right now? There's nothing light and momentary about being chained in a Roman prison, but he considered it light and momentary. He says, they're achieving for us an eternal glory that far outweighs them all. Yeah. All what? All of this stuff that I've been doing is light and momentary. Am I helping you today? Why do you say that? Because remember the statement, everything in this life is momentary in view of eternity. In view of eternity. If you get so earthly focused, you will consider all of this is so hard. This is so hard. And I'm not saying it's not. I'm just saying it's light and it's momentary. Number three, I'm going to fly through the next two points. God searches for you to be in his story. You God wants to take your messy life, turn into your message, but don't ever forget this. God is the one that, that it, he's the one that, that appeared to Paul on the road to Damascus. He's the one that searched for Paul. He's the one that sought him out. Romans 5, 8, but God demonstrates his own love for us in this. While we were still sinners, what do you do? Jesus Christ died for us. God doesn't wait for us to get our, our act cleaned up and Get right. No, 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 no. He doesn't do that. He says, no, I'm going to search you out even when you are, uh, I'll love you when you are unlovable. I'll search for you when you think that you've gone too far. Paul's messy life. Last thing is this. He teaches us how to deal with favor, f- failures. Number four, God's story always has a redemptive ending. Don't you ever forget that. God's, God's story always, everybody say always. Always. Always, when it's submitted to him, it's your, your life submitted to him. It always has a redemptive story. I don't care if you lived your entire life like a hellion. If you would just surrender, God says, I, there is a redemptive element to it if you'll give it to me. Redemptive in the fact that God doesn't just want to forgive your sins. That's actually short-sighted because surrendering your life to Jesus isn't the end. It's actually the beginning. 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse 15 Now, remember, this is Paul, Paul speaking. Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. And he goes, and guys, guess what? I am the worst of all of them. Like, if you think you're the best, you're, you're, you're bad, I was a complete wreck. And then he says, and I'm the worst of all of them, but God had mercy on me because he remembered his former life. So Christ 
could, could use me as a prime example of his great patience, even with the worst of sinners. I love that. God wants to use your life, think about that, our life as an example, as an example of his great patience, not his great judgment. When God looks at your messy life, it just proves that he's patient. He's not mean, he's not mad, he's gracious, he's patient, he's long-suffering. Now, here's the thing. God says, if God can use me, Paul said, if God can use me, God can use anybody. But if you stop reading right there, you miss, you miss the redemptive element to it. He says this, then others, everybody say others. That's right, then others will realize that they too, everybody say they too. So then others will realize that they too can believe him and receive eternal life. Here's, here's what God's saying here in the scripture. This life is not about you. That when, when, when God truly has a redemptive element to your life, that you can say all the other people that are looking in and peering into your life, they too can receive eternal life. That my redemptive story is not to make us look good, it's to make Jesus look good. Uh, when God redeems us, he wants to reconcile those around us to himself through the brokenness that our life was and the healed life that it now is. See, God has got some great things for you if you'd stop running from him and run to him and say, God, I know I'm a mess, I'm a little bit crazy, but if you can use me, you can have me. Amen? Let's all stand to our feet. Y'all get anything out of that today? Woo! Ah, uh, let's pray. I want to pray for you this morning. Heavenly Father, help us when we fall to our face and maybe the decisions that we made, it causes us to, to stumble at times. Lord, forgive us for trying to jump back up, trying to save face. Lord, we own our sin. If we, there's a mistake that's been made, we say, that was me. I'm sorry. Forgive me cleanse me from all unrighteousness. But Lord, while we're on our face and while we're on our knees, help your church to get busy cleaning. Help your church, your people to get busy doing something productive in, even in a season of turmoil, a season of mess. God, I pray that others would, around us this week, you would start to turn their face over to our lives as they see us just do our work unto you and serve people unto you. Lord, I pray that our life would literally be a magnifying glass of your grace. <laughs> of your grace, God. If it weren't for the grace of God, where would we be? God, I pray all the messy people under the sound of my voice that hope would rise. Hope would rise in their life and they would know, God, You've got a redemption, redemptive plan, a redemptive plan, a redemptive story. Therefore, we do not trust in horses, trust in chariots, but we put our faith in the Lord our God. It's not in the flesh, it's in you. It's not on how we behave, it's, it's in you. It's not how we get busy, it's just in you. Help us to be your people. Still in an attitude of prayer. I believe God's drawing people to himself right now. Right now. You're under the sound of my voice, whether here or on our online campus. And God is stirring your heart and you know it to be true. That you've fallen and you've made some mistakes, but God's saying, hey, there's no condemnation. Come on, get back up, get back up. And while you're getting back up, grab a towel. Serve somebody, do something. Use your gifts. Use your gifts that God gave you to be a blessing. If you're here today and you say, I want a relationship with God today. I'm not, I'm not playing games with God. I need a relationship with God, a real relationship with God. I want my prayers to feel like they, they go further than the ceiling. I want to know that I know that I know that I know him and he knows me. I'm not talking about joining a church. I'm just talking about joining Jesus. And I want to pray for you right now. I'm not asking you to come down forward. I'm just going to pray for you wherever you are, at home, wherever you're traveling, right here in this auditorium. 
If you're here, say, how could you count me in on that prayer? I mean business. I need a relationship with God. Or I need to rededicate my life to Christ. I've, I've walked away, but today, today I'm coming home and I'm renewing that relationship. On the count of three, just slip your hand up and slip it right back down. That's just you saying, yep, that's me. I want to renew that relationship with God. Are you ready? Come on. One, two, three. Anybody in this place right now? God bless you, sir. This is awesome. It's amazing. I'm going to lead you in a prayer. And all of us, everybody here and online, we're going to say this out loud. Out loud. Why out loud? Just to encourage the folks that raise their hand and say, I want a relationship with Jesus Christ today. Say this. Say, Heavenly Father, thank you that you did not give up on me. Lord, my life is a mess, but I submit my life to you today. I pray that you would heal my mess. <laughs> Jesus, Thank you for dying on a cross. God, thank you for raising him from the dead. I believe Jesus is the son of God. Jesus, be the Lord of my life. Save me. Heal me. I am all yours. In Jesus' name. Father, I thank you for what you've done today. And Lord, I pray for all the messy people in our life. God, I pray that you would help them, myself included, help, help us to live a life that would honor you. That, that we're not perfect, but we are forgiven. But Lord, we would, we, we'd live a life that would be so transparent and so honest and so vocal like Stephen in the evangelist. Yes, even the one that was, was murdered. He was vocal in his faith. Help us to not be rude, but be clear that Jesus is still Lord. God, I pray that the name of Jesus would be on our lips this week more than more than we normally would say. Lord, his name is, is, is life. His name is like sweet waters, is honey to our soul. Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of the living God. He is the rose of Sharon, the lily of the valley, the bright morning star, the first and the last, the beginning and the end. Jesus, you are still Lord. God, I pray that we would live a life that would honor that holy name this week. And let me pray a blessing on you before uh, Pastor Caleb comes up. May the May the blessing of the Lord just make you rich coming in and out. May God's hand be upon your hand this week. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord's face shine upon you. May the Lord establish you. And may God give you his peace by the Holy Spirit. And all God's people said, can we thank God for what God's done today? Come on.